All right, so this is the isopod discussion um, for cleanup crew, specifically for the Crabitat, and then also isopods in general. I love isopods. I got into them because of the hermit crabs. I wanted to look into um, a cleanup crew to clean up after the food they drag around, their poop all over the Crabitat. And once I got to doing internet searches, I discovered a whole world of beautiful creatures that are very intriguing. Um, and so today I have a few species, some that are not appropriate for the Crabitat, some that are appropriate for the Crabitat, and some that I think are just beautiful and worth sharing to uh, expose you guys that may not be familiar to isopods, um, to some of what's out there. And a very limited um, collection that I'm going to be presenting today. I'm going to have to move my phone around, so we're going to give you guys a heads up so we don't give you some motion sickness. Look away from the screen while I get it repositioned. I'm going to have to attach a macro lens. Uh, we found that worked the best. So jumping in, uh, what is a cleanup crew? I mentioned um, they clean up the leftover food. You know how we, you know, the hermit crabs are little wrecking balls. They drag it everywhere. They bury it, they take it off and dump it in the moss pit, what have you. Um, the isopods and springtails go around behind them and will eat these leftover items. They <clears throat> will consume um, the little feces that they drop. And springtails as well, they kind of work hand in hand. The springtails, I did not get any of those out that I think would just be a futile effort. Mm -hmm. Share what a springtail looks like. But they also consume uh, fungus, the mold that, fuzzy mold that grows in the tank. They do eat some of that. Um, they're really beneficial. They are not harmful to people. These things don't bite. They don't survive outside of the habitat and they're suitable enclosures. So if they do get loose in the house, there's a slight chance, um, but very slim that they will go and find anywhere and become a problem in the house. And so the different species of isopods, there's only a few that I feel are suitable for the Crabitat. Some keepers will disagree um, and for their own reasons, but I've talked to a bunch of more experienced people uh, that breed and keep isopods. Most of them do not have hermit crabs or familiarity, but knowing that some species are very protein hungry there is a potential risk to the crabs if they are molting um, and they're vulnerable. We all know that they need to be um, buried and have a safe space to molt. Some of these species do dig. A healthy molting crab is going to go deeper into the substrate than an isopod would, but we do occasionally see surface molts. We do see some crabs that, you know, they only go down under about yay big and he's, or you know, yay far down, you still see their shell. Those are definitely within range and access of the isopods. Um, so I would recommend you stick with the safer varieties that aren't as aggressive and protein hungry. There's other considerations such as uh, rate of reproduction. Some of these guys are like rabbits. They breed frequently, they have very large brood sizes. The gestation period is commonly um, about 60 days. But if you've got a species that is, you know, having 30 or more uh, babies at a time, that is a lot of reproduction. So that might be a concern for you as well. Um, looks, I mean, let's face it, some of them are kind of bug-like and a little creepy and not everybody's preference. Some people have a color preference. Some people have a body shape preference. Um, there's one species that I'm going to show you. I think they're adorable. They're inexpensive. They are native to Florida. It's the Cuberus murina. They're less bug-like. Um, uh, another common one. They don't roll into a ball. They're very quick moving. They're a little creepy. Some people think they look like silverfish, but a lot of people just love them. Becca here, uh, if you guys watch the show, talk yesterday, I had explained that that's how she and I met. She had posted on one of the groups wanting information about getting isopods. And we had gotten into a discussion and narrowed down what worked for her. She liked the um, color pattern of the Porcelianites Pruinosis Oreo Crumble. 
and I sent her her first uh, batch of isopods and she since has gotten two other species from me and some springtails. So and and my volunteer springtails. Yes, she has um, native homegrown springtails find their way into her habitat. And it was actually kind of funny. She thought these were the ones I sent. And she didn't know if their population had just exploded and almost black and the ones I sent her were white. So we got a laugh out of that, but she didn't even need to buy springtails. She got some uh, the old fashioned way. So those are some of the considerations. Um, you know, rate of reproduction, the size, the uh, burrowing habits, um, how protein hungry they are, the potential risk of the crabs. And next up is where do you get isopods? Some people collect them from outside, which is possible. You can do that. It's recommended that if you do that, you put them in a separate enclosure and culture them, allow them to reproduce to make sure that they're healthy, they are not bringing in any kind of contamination. Um, maybe they've been exposed to pesticides or something like that. And you only want to source them from an area that you know for certain that has not had any contact um, with anything toxic that we wouldn't want our hermit crabs coming in contact with. So once they've reproduced and you have that next generation of uh, baby isopods, you can introduce those into the tank. You can buy them on the internet. They are shipped next day air or second day air. Some people even do three day, but it really depends on the weather of where, from where they're coming from and the temperatures on where you are. They need to be in a safe range. Um, these are live animals. So the shipping is gonna be a little expensive. You can expect to spend probably up to $30 for shipping, um, but their safety is important and local reptile breeders, uh, reptile stores may have them, you can check there. And another benefit of that is when they get to being a little too um, high in numbers for your liking, uh, find out if the dealer will take them back. They may take them back. Um, so that would also be another reason to look local. Um, and if you do go to buy online, make sure you're looking for somebody with a good reputation and something called a lag or live animal guarantee, although some call it live arrival guarantee. This is a money back guarantee that your isopods, when they come in, at least at the time that you open the box, they don't guarantee it beyond that, um, but they usually give you about 30 minutes to an hour of receiving them to make sure that they're alive. And if any of them did die, uh, they will reimburse you. So that is important because you can spend quite a bit of money on these guys. Um, how many do you need? That's a question I see asked frequently. And a lot of people throw out the number of how big their cage is and how many crabs they have. That really is irrelevant. A starter culture um, will work for, no, you know, no matter if you have a 20 gallon tank or a 200 gallon tank. 10 to 15 isopods is a good number to get a colony established. In a matter of time, they will reproduce. You'll have plenty enough. So I would recommend just starting with um, the 10 to 15. And the springtails are usually sold in the starter culture. It'll just be a tub. They don't count them. You may not even see them. They'll be in the dirt. They are very tiny. And you just dump the little container in your tank and eventually you'll see them. Um, so setting up an enclosure. I'm gonna go grab some visuals. Okay, can you guys see this tub? Yep. Yeah. This is a regular shoebox size tub. I got these at Ikea and I drill holes. Can you see the holes? Yeah, I drill holes all along the side. Different species require um, different amounts of ventilation. And then I get organza fabric and use Mod Podge to glue it on because the isopods, they aren't supposed to be able to climb smooth surfaces, but the, um, the mineral deposits from spraying the tub and then also just little bits of, um, or if you have a leaf, you got a stem that's sticking up, they can climb that and they will come out of these holes. And you will find isopods in different bins, in weird spaces, dead on the floor from desiccation, that's drying out. Um, so 
cover the holes, but they can chew through those. So you need to monitor that to make sure they're not chewing their way out. I did have a species do that. So in the tub, you're gonna put together a substrate. You wanna look into that. It's a, there's a lot of um, information out there on the different types of substrates you can set up, but typically um, organic gardening soil with added worm castings, and then you take leaf litter, crumble that up and put that in there. And they need a moisture gradient. So this represents a 50%. You can see how moist this is. I over moistened it for uh, so you guys could see a contrast. So you're gonna have a drier side and a moist side. That way they can regulate how much moisture they want, um, what they need at that time. And in the moist side, Typically you add a bunch of sphagnum moss. This is orchid moss, but um, any of the sphagnum, sphagnum mosses that are uh, suitable that we also use for our habitat moss pits will work. Now these guys eat decaying uh, leaves. So the same leaf litter that you guys would be giving your crabs, or should be if you're not, you need to start, um, this is a staple in the crab diet, um, but the same leaf litter that you would offer your crabs, you need to keep a good um, heavy layer in the crab cat or in the uh, isopod enclosure, and decaying wood. You can buy this stuff online, or if you can guarantee that your area is safe, uh, free from exposure to pesticides, herbicides, all that stuff, decaying. I'm gonna make a mess. So this stuff just flakes apart. This is decaying. Uh, I can't remember what species of wood this is, but they will eat that. And it's also good to mix into their substrate. Now, one type of enclosure I don't recommend are these things, these critter keepers. This is way too much ventilation. You guys are probably familiar with these. They have this vented lid and it also has vents on the side. Again, I uh, covered it with the fabric. These will allow too much moisture to evaporate and dry out. It is a maintenance nightmare. I don't recommend getting these. Just your regular Sterilite, um, Storage tubs are ideal. So for food, you can supplement their food. Actually, a lot of the hermit... <laughs> I'm sorry, the chicken's on the porch. Um... <laughs> sorry. So Rapashi Morningwood is... <laughs> Sorry, very distracting. Okay. So Rapashi morning wood is a product specifically for isopods. This is good, but also a lot of the foods that we all already feed are hermit crabs. Um, a lot of you guys buy the quality stuff off of um, Etsy. These guys, isopods are terrestrial crustaceans. They are actually very closely related to hermit crabs that we keep. Um, so a lot of the safe foods overlap both. So if it's safe for your hermit crabs, it's safe for your isopods. Um, I'm a little more liberal with what I'll allow them to eat. Like I supplement my guys with cichlid pellets. I would not feed this to my hermit crab. There's nothing toxic in there, but why would I feed this to a crab? They have much better food options. But this is a really convenient um, supplemental food for my isopods. So this kind of stuff you want to add in. Um, a higher protein diet will encourage breeding um, in them. And they also need calcium, just like the isopods do. So I keep a piece of cuddle bone in all of my enclosures. And I also give them um, shrimp shells. And like I said, a lot of the things that we already feed our hermit crabs are perfect for these guys. So are there any questions on setting up the enclosures? No? Okay. 
So if anybody has any questions, just jump in. Becca will uh, interrupt me. And, oh, one more thing worth mentioning is how to take care of them. When you're culturing them, you need to stay on top of their moisture content in their moisture gradient. Um, keep that moist side moist, but not dripping wet. You don't want to flood it. Too much moisture is bad. It can kill, but also allowing it to get too dry can um, cause death as well. And so we went over the nutritional needs, the products needed. One thing also to mention, another similarity, you need to give them treated water, just like the hermit crabs. So when you go to mist the enclosure and add water to their substrate, only use treated water. Okay, so now when you go and buy your isopods online from a reputable breeder, they are ready to add to the tank. You only need to isolate um, and quarantine the ones that you might catch outside. And, but the other ones, just take the container. They are usually shipped in um, a little deli cup with some sphagnum moss. Just take the whole thing, set it in the tank and let them go. You probably will not see them for a good while. They're going to disperse. You're going to think they must have all died or been eaten. That's not the case. They like to hide. They like to stay hidden. And eventually, once you have a lot of them, you're going to see them in the food dish. Once you go to feed the hermit crabs, you're going to get a flood of isopods coming in, chowing down just right next to the crabs. Um, so things to consider. A lot of people, they're wondering, can they hurt the crabs? No, they can't. Um, except, like I mentioned earlier, the molting crabs. So carefully selecting the isopods uh, based on the characteristics that are suitable for the crab habitat. Um, definitely one of the main considerations. Escaping the tank. I had mentioned they can't climb smooth surfaces, but in the crab habitat, the silicone at the corners of the tank, they can climb that. They can climb that quite well. Now your crab habitat should have a sealed lid to maintain humidity. As long as your crab habitat is set up to standards, you should not have an escape issue uh, with your isopods. And again, if they do escape, your home environment isn't usually hospitable enough. They are going to die somewhere in the home. And dealing with overpopulation, Eventually, they're going to keep reproducing. Yes, if you limit the amount of resources, you know, they can't reproduce more than the environment can support, but they can get pretty high in numbers, and maybe it's too much for you. So maybe what your tank could support is way too many isopods than you ever wanted to have. You can find um, local, like I said, the local reptile dealers. If you join any reptile group, Eater, the insectivores um, will eat the isopods and they are very nutritious. So if anybody has um, reptiles that they keep in addition to their hermit crabs, they will eat those and they are um, naturally high in calcium. Um, you don't have to do the gut loading like you would with uh, crickets. These guys are ready to go, very nutritious right out of the crab attack. Um, so as long as that doesn't bother you to feed your little isopods to your other animals. Um, now, if you need to just kill them humanely, putting them in the freezer is at this point the most accepted way to euthanize them. And then once they're dead, you can put them in the food dish, your crab, or yeah, your hermit crabs will eat them. Um, and again, they're very nutritious for the hermit crabs as well. Another thing people ask, can we keep multiple species together? If you are culturing as a hobbyist, you do not want to mix them in bins. You want to have a separate bin for each individual species and each individual morph. Um, and that's where you get different colors or patterns out of the one species. So if you're trying to breed true, you know, the, the zebras, I'm going to show you some zebras, they're black and white striped. People have isolated yellow and black striped. So you want to keep those separate if you're trying to get those to breed true. But in the crab habitat, there really isn't an issue mixing them. So if you like the pruinosis and you also like some of the armadillidiums, you can toss them in there. Um, they'll do fine to cohabitate in the tank. Now, the next thing is going to be the uh, showing off, I don't remember how many species I collected. I think it's around 15. 
So I'm going to have to reposition the camera. Um, so before we do that, are there any questions? I know I kind of went quickly through this, but we got a late start. Oh, okay. So we we're talking about my chicken. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> one, um, one thing that I might recommend mentioning is just which specific species you do recommend. I know you'll go through that a little more with, with your fashion show, but. Okay. Yeah, we can go over that now. Um, in fact, what might be nice, if anybody is considering getting isopods and you had your eyes set on something, but you're undecided, if you want to just comment with what it was you were looking at, uh, one that I see thrown out there a lot is the Labus dairy cow. Or that's one of the ones I wanted. Yes, that's one Becca wanted, and that's one that is on my I do not suggest list. Um, and I have those guys. So... The Lavis are um, really rapidly reproducing. They will burrow and they are very protein hungry. I brought out one of my um, larger tubs of the Lavis milk back and I have put in entire pieces of different crustaceans. Um, these guys will swarm it and it'll be devoured in no time. Um, dwarf whites are another uh, species I don't really recommend. They are almost exclusively staying buried into the substrate. They are very tiny. They may not be as voracious of an eater, have such a, a large appetite, but they're one that would make me uneasy. And a lot of keepers recommend them. And if you were to message a breeder and say, I've got hermit crabs, what do you suggest? They might tell you dwarf whites. Um, and they might be safe, but again, considering it little bit of a contentious topic. Some people say yes, some people say no. Let's just play it safe and get the ones that are pretty much universally safe and appropriate for the hermit crabs. Um, oh, you Debbie, mean, do you have any particular breeders you recommend? Okay, uh, that was something I did want to go over as well. I do have um, a list of people that they don't have a uh, like a website for you to go to um, but if you want to email me at info at hermitharbor.com I have uh, a guy that I've used out in California that's wonderful um, he has some more of the more rare species um, but I'm pretty sure he's got a couple that would be suitable that are on my suitable list um, there's somebody in Nevada Brielle Page um, she's also an approved seller with Lycos for her hermit crab food, Crab Attack Cafe. Um, Misty Thompson, she has MT Pet Emporium. And because I'm on the spot right now, I cannot remember what state she's in, but she's out in the Midwest. In Ohio, there is Pet Peds and Pods. Um, her name is Rachel. She is wonderful. She does different expos. So if you guys are in Ohio, you can actually go to the expo and talk to her. She's a really interesting, knowledgeable person. Um, there is somebody in New Hampshire that I know. So I've got some people, uh, if you're looking for someone a little closer to home, that'll save shipping and then also um, accommodate the weather challenges. Like I'm in Florida, central Florida. If it's high 80s or 90s here, but you're in the, um, you know, one of the cooler northern states, there's the logistical issue of keeping them cool while they're with me and warm when they get to you. Um, so there is some benefit to finding a reputable breeder a little closer to home. Um, but yes, info at hermitharbor.com. Um, of course, I would like to sell my isopods. And actually right now, I have so many of the powder orange and I should have thought to box them up to show you guys. Um, I am literally giving them away for CrabCon. All you have to do is pay shipping. And right now is a decent time of year to ship anywhere. So that, um, I was putting that in the VIP offer thing and it didn't work out to add them to the store. So email me if you're interested in having the free powder orange um, and springtails, just pay shipping and I will be happy to get them sent out to you. Um, but you can also email me to get a list of uh, breeders that I recommend, somebody that might be closer to you. Okay. Yeah, Tracy, I'd be happy to. Um, I can sell you some of the other ones, and I would be more than happy to uh, 
do the, the free guys. All right, so I'm going to switch the camera over to the macro lens and um, reposition it. So there's going to be some jarring action. If you want to look away, we'll announce when we're ready to have you resume watching. All right. We're good? Okay. Evie, while you're adjusting, um, we do have a question. Are most isopod species created through selective breeding or are they naturally occurring? Naturally occurring. Um, these guys, they are different regional. Um, and I'll tell you, hopefully I can remember most of where or where most of them come from. Um, I have some specimens that are in, uh, all right, let me set something here to make sure I've got my macro on there correctly. I should have done this this week. Whoops. It's that whole struggle bus thing again. Did I finish answering that question? Somewhat. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, they are naturally occurring um, in different parts. Some of them are, um, they've been imported into the U.S. Uh, many years ago, and so now they're widely available throughout the country. Um, but they did start off natural um, native somewhere else. And there is a difference between native and naturalized. But yeah, some of them have gotten loose where they didn't actually come from, but they are so well established that they might as well be native. Okay, so just to test out, can we see this guy well enough? Yes, he looks great. Okay. Back if he'll quit, if he'll quit uh, being uncooperative. <laughs> Yeah, you're good. He's just moving out of frame or trying to. Yes. All right, and I just picked him in no particular order. Um, there's actually a few in this little container. These are a Porcelio species. This is the Ornatus high or chocolate high yellow. And okay, can you guys see him pretty good? Yep. Yep, he looks good. So these guys do not roll into a ball. These are not one of the suitable ones. Um, these are more of a hobbyist collection. What I like about them is their personality. You can see they're really pretty chill. He'll just hang out. Now he's gonna go take a stroll up my finger. Um, these guys are a lot of fun to just keep to observe. They do eat a lot of protein. Um, so it's kind of fun when you get them some different foods. I started feeding my isopods starfish, and some of the species have really enjoyed it. All right, let me get this guy off of here. I'm using a delicate artist paintbrush to reposition them, move them around, and try and get them off of my hand. Okay. Another one of the ones that I think are cool, but a lot of people probably think are creepy. This is another Renatus. This one is called a Nord from the region where they were found. Can we guys see him? Yeah, you can see him. He's so big that, that you can yeah. see him right there. Let me try and get I like these guys, again, because of their chill personality. They'll let you handle them. Um, They're also giant. <laughs> yes, they are very large. And I am not a dainty individual. I'm about five foot eight, so my hands are not exactly small. You can see this guy, and he's not even the biggest in my tank. He's quite large. 
and I just think they're really neat. All right, I'm going to try and get him put back. He was a little more agreeable with that idea. All right, these are the Lavis milk bag. These are the same um, species as the dairy cows. They are both uh, Porcelia Lavis. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> that one says no thanks. Yes. You can see them really well, though, so it's okay. Okay. Breed like crazy. They are uh, the one I mentioned earlier that are very protein hungry. When they get, um, when they're offered a, a food, I've seen them fight over one of those cichlid, cichlid pellets, um, literally tug of war, uh, fighting over this food. And they do burrow into the substrate, maybe only an inch, inch and a half, but I don't keep a lot of substrate in the container. So these guys would not be suitable, but they are kind of fun to keep as a, as a pet. All right, here's the latest dairy cow. And they're trying to hide out under their moss. All right, can you see these guys? Yeah, just give it a second to focus. These guys are black and white. They're kind of neat in their pattern. Can we see them? Yep. Good enough, at least? Yes. Yeah, I think they're good. Okay. Oh, now he's being cooperative. Yeah, I didn't realize my session got moved. So these guys have been sitting in these little containers for a little longer than I was, I was hoping for. But I think they're doing okay. They've got plenty of moisture. Um, but obviously, this isn't how they would be, prefer to be waiting around. All right, next up, uh, this is on the acceptable species list. Um, this is the Pruinosis powder blue. And these guys come in different colors. There's the blue that you have here. There's pied powder blue, also called Oreo crumble, which um, look very similar to the dairy cow. Let's see if I can get this little guy closer. that coming into focus? It's working on it. There he goes, he's getting getting better. Perfect, yep, there you go. Yeah, these are the ones that are what I refer to as more bug-like. Yep, there you saw how quick they run. Um, but they're a nice enough species, but they're not for everybody as far as appearance and behavior. Um, but they are one of probably the most uh, common or popular for use in the Crabitat. And they're inexpensive, um, but they do breed very, very well. But they do make a great feeder, so if you've got friends or a reptile store that would like to have some free feeders, they would love to have these guys from you, I'm sure. All right, and the ones that Becca got... Or did I already show you guys these Oreo nope, crumbles? Nope, haven't showed those yet. Okay, so these are the Oreo crumble or pied powder blue. And I saw a few months ago, somebody, they started calling it an orange creamsicle, but it's a powder orange with white. And it's actually kind of cool looking, um, but I certainly don't need more specimen tubs to take care of. Can we see that? I can see him, but then I also know what he looks like. <laughs> I actually have those guys 
from Evie and she sent me about a dozen and now I probably have about a hundred at least. And I love them. They're adorable. And do they do a good job cleaning up the crab tank? Oh, yes. All right. Now, this guy is a juvenile. Uh, he's just a, a youngster. And he won't get off the brush. Okay. While you're swapping out your cup, um, which slow breeder do you most recommend? Okay. Um, probably the Murina. They, they breed well enough, but they are not nearly as um, productive as the Peronosis. These are a Cubera species, and these are native to Florida. I'm trying to get one of them on the thing. These have the more traditional roly-poly look. Um, that guy's just going to keep somersaulting. These guys will roll into a ball. They are very cute. One of my favorite things about them is when they walk, they wiggle their antenna. They don't want to cooperate? No. They're being a little busy today. All right, well, I'm just gonna take some of their hiding areas away and then maybe you guys will be able to get a better view. Can you see him? Yes. Just give him a second to focus. There you go. Perfect. Do you see how the little antenna wiggle? I just think that is the cutest thing. But he's headed back to his moss. So that's the Murina. Um, these guys are inexpensive um, for purchase. And being native to Florida, the temperature, humidity of the crab habitat is ideal for them. And they also come in a different color. These guys are going to be harder to see because they actually match the color of the moss. Um, this is called Murina papaya. And I actually have a few in here and I can't can't get anybody to um, volunteer to show themselves off. Okay. Can you guys see him? There he is. Yep. Perfect. So these guys are kind of a peach color. But same characteristics. They do well with the temperature and humidity of the habitat. They are not as productive reproducing um, as some of the other species. But these guys are low risk and I think really cute. And usually when they're startled, they'll roll into a ball, but this one's just as happy to try and run away. All right. So those are um, the Prunosis and the Murina are my favorites uh, to recommend for the uh, crab habitat. But another one is the Armadillidium species. Some of these are uh, pretty ordinary. They're color patterns. I'm going to show you one of my favorites. This is another one that I gave um, to Becca. This Parakeet? Is, yes, Parakeet. Try and get that to focus. One thing I love about these guys is they are so docile. Perfect. They just hang out and you can observe them. There's nothing wrong with this guy. He's not sick. He's not dead. He's just perfectly chill to just sit here and have you guys look at him. Something I really like about these guys. And I love the color. Um, the image for this session, that is actually a parakeet with the macro lens. You can see the texture of them. You can actually see they have compound eyes in that picture. All right, next one, these are granulatum. These are one of the larger armadillidiums, but again, 
These Good. guys are pretty. And gray with some amount of the um, yellow spotting. All right, these are the ones I was mentioning that are from um, Italy. I believe they're also uh, can be found in France. These are Grenier, or, uh, Gestroy. Can you see them? Yes, you see those guys very well. Yeah, they have this really vivid color pattern. And they get to be a decent size, so they're a good um, specimen, you know, for just keeping to look at because they're so pretty. So we're good on those? Yes, perfect. Okay. And those guys are not um, very expensive to acquire. When I say very expensive, uh, you can spend from a dollar per isopod, you know, for one. So $10 for a 10 count um, up to well over $100. I believe one of the most expensive species I've acquired was $140 or $160 for one. Um, so you can really break the bank on these guys. Uh, it just depends on how, how much you want to spend and if they really appeal to you. All right, that covers the handful of armadillidium species that I chose to set out. Now these are uh, the cuberas. Oh, wait. Did I show you guys the zebra? No. I don't think I did. I just saw these little guys sitting here. One more, the zebra. These guys are really popular. A lot of people like these. They've got this really neat pattern and quite obvious as to why it's called a zebra. You guys see him? He's very clear. Now I've struggled to keep these, they're a little finicky. I have not put all of these species in the crab tat. Um, I have only done the murina and the prunosis. Um, and I did put in a scaber species, which are not on the recommended list, uh, but I don't know, we're all novice and not and a- And I, have, I and have the parakeets in mine as well. Yes, um, I asked Becca to test those out and see how well they enjoyed that environment. Um, and so far they're doing good. Now these guys are a little expensive to, you know, just purchase as a cleanup crew. These are a Cuberus rubber ducky. A lot of people love these. Um, they roll into a ball as this guy's doing. I'm gonna see if I can get him out to hold him. Oh, you can see his little duck face. Yes. He'll, uh, he'll decide to reemerge and not play dead anymore in a minute. I hope. Come on, man. Now, when you're handling these guys, you do need to be delicate with them. They have an exoskeleton, but they can be squished. They can be injured. Um, So you don't want to just pick them up or allow your children to pick them up. They will go and scurry off and hurt themselves. Just falling off your hand. All right. I was hoping he would start moving so you guys could see. Can you see that guy on the moss? Yes. That's a juvenile. All right, well that guy's just not, um, he's not gonna uncurl for you guys, I guess. Well, darn it, he was one I really wanted you to see. Okay, well, we'll put him back. All 
right, and this is the last one. These are another one of my favorite Cuberis. Again, I have not put these in the Cravitat, but they would be suitable. Um, they like the type of environment that we maintain. These are called Panda Kings. They're a really good starter Cuberis. They are absolutely adorable in my opinion. These were one of my first Cubera species. Can you see him well? Yes. And wait till he walks. We'll do the little antenna wiggle thing. I must have something interesting on my hand. He's checking out. Smell like all those other isopods. You've been cheating on him. Actually, I don't know if you can see it, but it looks like he was munching on my um, skin. I have a video of one of my uh, scabers, the the dead skin cells. And my hand, my skin is kind of dry right now. I could have used some moisturizer, but uh, you don't want to put anything like that on your hands when you're going to handle these guys. Yeah, so he's uh, really interested in checking out whatever's on my my skin or actually just my skin. I wish I could get this better. Oh, you can't really see, can you? Oh, you can you can see him, yeah. Can you see that he's nibbling on me? <laughs> yes, that's weird. <laughs> so anyways, um, it doesn't hurt. You don't even feel it. But I guess I'll uh, give him a snack. Give him a little bit of more uh, diversity in his diet. All right. So that, that wraps up the... Um, the few species that I did gather for you guys. Becca, should I show them the milk back tab? Sure, yeah, just that that piece of so he, what, that uh, piece of cork. You might want to take your macro off. Yes. Yeah, that way you guys will have an idea of what um, your lavis, such as your dairy cows, can do. Also, so this, while you're doing that, um, Christine, yes, Evie does sell isopods. Yes. All right. So this is a 28-quart tub. So you can also get an example of what a isopod enclosure looks like. And these are the Lavis uh, milk bags, the same or similar to a dairy cow. So under all of these pieces of pork, can you see how many are there? Oh yes, tons. And then down under the leaves. And yes, I do not mind. Oh, and this one's uh, changing into some kind of white. He's losing his milk back pattern. So if I wanted to keep this, uh, true oops it just fell off um i would need to take those out of this enclosure but yes if anybody has any reptiles that you would like to have some feeders um you can buy these guys as well for that and let's see if i can find anybody that's kind of buried I guess most of them are on the surface. A lot of times you'll find the um, juveniles under. So yeah, nobody's hanging out in the dry side over here. But yeah, they are all over. Yeah, there we go. Now you see how they're coming out of the substrate? So these guys do bury or burrow into the substrate. 
Becca, is that coming through? Yes. Yeah, you can see it moving. Okay, perfect. Especially with the contrast of the dark soil and the light isopods. So, yeah, this is a this is a good example of what I was saying, how they do stay under the substrate. So if they were to encounter your molting crab, I could see where this would be a risk to their safety. Um, even though I like these guys, I think they're pretty cool. I would not keep them in my in my crab habitat. Yeah, this guy's losing his milk back pattern too. So he'd need to come out to keep that pattern true. All right, so that wrapped up everything um, that we had planned. <laughs> Evie, you said that container was 26 liter? Uh, 28 quarts. 28 quarts, there you go. Yeah. But most of mine are, I think they're 12 quarts. It's a shoebox size. Yeah, sorry, I should be giving you a heads up on the motion sickness thing. Yeah. Oh. Somebody's got a question I don't know if you'll know the answer to. Can a leopard gecko thrive on only or mainly isopods? Um, I don't know about only or mainly. Um, I personally don't believe you should feed a single source of nutrition, just like you wouldn't want to give them just mealworms. And I actually have a leopard gecko. Um, he loves his mealworms. The crickets are kind of a pain to keep, um, but you don't want to feed them just one type of protein source or food source. So I don't I can't confidently speak to that, but just animal husbandry care guidelines in general, I would not feed just a single, um, a single type of food. But these guys would not need to be dusted in any kind of additional calcium. And again, if you keep the, the geckos, you've probably heard of gut loading your crickets um, and other um, animals or feeders before you feed them. And I actually also breed discoid roaches. <sighs> My son cracked me up. We went and bought him some lettuce. And I was like, oh, yeah, honey, go grab some lettuce for the roaches. He's like, shh, you probably shouldn't say that that loud. <laughs> Mom, people are going to look at us. Uh, um, so, yes, I would definitely, it's great to add these guys in. And they are probably more nutritious than some of the other feeder options. Um, but I don't, I personally wouldn't make them a single a single source. Anybody else have questions? Uh, the last question on here. Um, what's the best place to get the ones for your crab attack? I know you mentioned MT Pet Emporium. Of course you have them. Brielle has them. Yes. Um, there is uh, Frog Daddy. I think it's frogdaddy.net. Um, but definitely send me an email. Now I'm getting inundated with email and then also general questions. So it might take me a couple of days to get back to people. Just this CrabCon thing is really, um, so send me an email, I'll happily, just let me know what state you're in and I can give you some resources. Um, frogdaddy.net, um, isopods.com or something like that. Um, and there's a few Facebook groups um, for networking with isopod keepers. And there's some people, um, I can't remember where trying lives, but there's this one guy, he's been fantastic. Uh, one of the things to look for, like a good reputable isopod they want you to be successful with uh, the species you select, and they will um, help you uh, by giving you their instructions. Some of the species need more moisture, less moisture, um, different dietary requirements, the ventilation requirements. Um, so a good reputable breeder is going to take the time to give you the care necessities for that species that we're telling you. Um, so that's another consideration. You definitely want to make sure you pick somebody that's going to give the time to you to, to do that. Especially, I mean, if you're spending hundreds of dollars on single species, um, they they can take a little bit of time to give you have some success with them. Um, right for that. Uh, typically, so the Panda Kings, now the prices, the longer the isopod, isopods have been available in the hobby, the lower the price gets. 
Uh, the rubber duckies used to be one of the highest price. We moved down the list. Um, more people have them, more people breed them. They're not as hard to get your hands on. So the prices have come down. Um, it's really best just, just a, a search on the internet to find out what the, the prices are. Um, currently, I don't, not all of my species are available for sale. I want them to get a bit more established. Um, I've had a bit of a learning curve with some of them. Uh, some of them have done much better than others, uh, particularly the Cubera species. But I've actually had some of my cultures crash when the temperatures went up and the AC has been running more. Uh, it removes humidity from the air, so it was actually drying out my enclosures faster than normal, and that slipped my mind. So some of my cultures, um, I've had some losses, and so my numbers aren't as, um, they're not as well populated. So I don't sell all of my species, um, but the ones that I do have, like the, uh, the Marina, the uh, Powder Blue, uh, those guys are just a dollar a piece, so $10 for a 10 count. Um, the milk bags are a little more, um, they're a couple of dollars, two, three dollars a piece um, for those guys. And what are the largest ones that are also really good to go with the crabs? Um, the largest. Well, the gastroids, the armadillidiums, some of the armadillidiums are quite large. Those would probably be the largest that I would feel comfortable keeping in the, the crab habitat. The nords, um, those are one I I love them. They would not be a good suitable species, in my opinion, to go into the crab habitat. Um, but yeah, if you like something that's large that you can look at, especially when you end up in that pet sand phase, and all your crabs are gone and, you know, people have to take your word for it that you actually have an animal in there, um, your isopods can, can definitely fill in the gap, um, give you something to look at. Um, just a note, too, just because I know you don't really have them on your website, so probably best for people just to email you if they want to buy isopods. Yeah, the um, trying to work it out to where I could list them on my website. Um, the website would not prevent you from ordering isopods along with shells and leaf litter and everything else. These guys need to ship in an insulated box, so foam lining all sides, um, ice packs or warm or hot packs in there. So you can't combine these with, um, you know, half a dozen shells and some cuddle bone. Um, it just won't work that way. Um, so they really need to ship by themselves, maybe with a couple other items, but they do need to ship by themselves in this insulated box. And it was not working out to get that set up in my store. Um, I might actually need to change uh, platforms and go to a different, uh, more robust site with more features and customization. Um, before I can add them to my store. So yeah, email me um, and I'd be happy to send you uh, pictures of, you know, if there's a species that you're curious to see, um, I'll happily send you more information. And then I would just need to know your uh, location to a shipping quote and then find out if the temperatures are suitable for um, safely shipping them. Um. The names of the ones that you suggested, um, that's going to be the armadillidium, the Procellionitis. Yeah. And what's the other one? I'll type them out wrong. I've got them typed, so I was just trying to. Okay. Uh, yes, the Procellionitis, it's... Um... So I put powder dot, dot, dot. So it's a pruinosis. You'll find them as powder blue, powder orange, pied powder blue, or Oreo crumble. Um, there's also a white, um, I believe they're white out or something like that. But look for the pruinosis. And then um, I don't see why any Cubera species would not be appropriate. Um, but the Murina and Murina papaya, 
And actually, I think murina should be lowercase because the, the genus is capitalized, the species is lower. Um, but yeah, the papaya, that's the same thing as the little gray guys, just a different color if you have a preference on those. And the more, um, there's a little more involved in getting to breed those. But yeah, the armadillinium, um, my personal favorite again is the parakeet. I'll type that one in. Um, not everybody thinks they're as fantastic as I do, but I just love them for their um, chill demeanor. They sit there, like you can go in, you saw how they just stayed on that little piece of wood. I was able to handle them. So if you like admiring the animals you have and spending time um, just enjoying them, they're a great one, great one to hang on to. Any other questions? We had so much more content yesterday. I felt like it was a lot more active, but now there, this is just the surface of isopods. There's so much more that goes into it. Um, so if you wanna get into the hobby, um, I suggest finding some of the um, isopod Facebook groups, um, start networking, asking questions. Um, I barely gave you enough to get started. So if you want to go out in the yard and collect them, you know how to set up a tub. Um, and depending on your location, where you are, you're going to find species. But then again, you can, you know, find some in the yard, take a good clear picture in one of these groups, ask them to identify them. Because um, some of these species are um, native. Some of the not good for you species, not good for your crab habitat, are native in the United States. Um, and of course, I know this is a international convention, so there may be people outside the United States, um, but I'm not as familiar with those. So some of your native species may not be appropriate. So clear pictures, put them on those Facebook. There's plenty of knowledgeable people that are always happy to jump in, um, do these. And then you can find out from there if they're suitable. Um, generally, I would say Generally, I'm just going to put a general thing, Porcelio. Now, Porcelio is different than the Porcelionite, or Porcelionites, however you want to pronounce that, or however it should be. Um, so just Porcelio, that is, just in a summary, the ones to avoid. So uh, the Lavis, a lot of people say dairy cow. Um, did anybody ask, is it, is there a specific one that they were considering that they wanted an opinion on? Um, no Lavis, uh, the dwarf whites, I don't care for, but then again, a lot of keepers do say they're okay. So you're going to find just like in the hermit crab world, a lot of conflicting information. Um, so you really need to, to choose what sounds right to you. Um, you I don't really, you know, what I'm saying. Um, there's some personal decision there, uh, but I like the better safe than sorry. Um, so yeah, no Lavis. I don't like the dwarf whites. Um, the Scaber, although I love them, um, and I have quite a few of them, I don't feel that they're appropriate for the hermit crabs. Hold on a second. Becca, were there any specific species or that people were wondering about? Um, nothing that was mentioned specifically, just asking about like if certain ones were okay or whatever. Just basically the ones that you mentioned. Yeah, one of my favorites for scabers that I think are beautiful. Trying to keep them in a safe. He just fell off too. I have their little tub right below them. These guys, these are lava. They have um, this red and kind of like a feely blue color. These would be on the no-go for me habitat list. These are one of my favorites. Another color pattern. I don't know if he's coming in very clear. 
Not really. He's a he's a little fuzzy, but you don't have your macro on anymore, so. Right. But yes, these guys do personality. I'm sure they chill and hang out. Others are scatter like roaches when the lights come on. Yeah, thanks, Becca, for grabbing that. No problem. Now, I, am not, I have not personally heard of um, anybody having that problem um, where they came across a surface molter and uh, their isopods are attacking it, um, but it could potentially happen, um, and I'm sure it has happened. Somebody had to learn that the hard way somehow, I'm sure. Um, well, we spend so much try time trying to make sure that our crabs are in the best environment. I mean, everybody that's here cares enough about their hermit crabs that they're spending their weekend at a hermit crab convention. So, and probably taking some ribbing for it. <laughs> probably. People make a, a convention. What? And you're talking about people care about that. So, all right. Well, we went a little over schedule, so we're gonna wrap this up unless anybody has any questions. And if something occurs to you later on, like I, like I said, always welcome to email me. You're not wasting my time. I love talking crabs and isopods because my friends and family can only stand to hear so much. Um, info, I-N-F-O at hermitharbor.com. And if you'd like to buy isopods from me, um, great. If it's better for you to buy them elsewhere, I would rather do what's best for you and the isopods. And if you're interested in doing the free um, powder orange, uh, porcelainitis powder, powder oranges, um, I can ship them out uh, as soon as the weather's permitting. And right now it's good on my end. So, all right, thank you, Becca. All right, enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thank you.